Shalom family. And welcome back to part three of Peter or Judas. Which one are you? Last time we was here, we was discussing how Peter left away weeping after he denied Yeshua three times. This will be a part of the shaking. When the women came to anoint Yeshua after his death, they found the stone rolled away and they saw a young man sitting on the right side clothed in a long white garment. He informed them to go tell his disciples and Peter that Yeshua is no longer here and they shall see him in Galilee. Now, the women found a young man. First of all, they weren't expecting to find the tomb rolled away. So when they found the young man in there, the first thing that they was wondering is, where is Yeshua? Where is his body? But the young man informed them that he is no longer here. The young man also informed them to tell the disciples, not only the disciples, but make sure you tell Peter also to come and meet him in Galilee. He will meet them there. Notice that he separated Peter from the disciples because of what Peter had done in the last segment when we talked. Peter left away bitterly weeping because Yeshua had already told him that he was going to deny him three times before the cock crowed. Peter didn't believe that. He was showing his loyalty. He had no told him to know Yeshua. No matter what happens to you, if they take you to prison, if they take you to death, I'm going right there with you. And Yeshua was trying to basically tell him, you're not ready. You're not ready. Not yet, you're not. But I hear what you're saying, Peter. We would have been doing that same thing. Trying to prove our loyalty, regardless of whether somebody's trying to show us something different or tell us something different about ourselves. No, we're, we're not trying to hear that because we know what's deep within our hearts. Sometimes what's deep within our heart doesn't come to the surface right away. Sometimes it takes time. When you go through certain things, more of what's in your heart tends to come out. When the women found Peter, he was with another disciple. The women informed them that someone had taken away the Lord and they didn't know where they took the body. The amazing thing is that the young man told them that the body wasn't there no more. Also told them that Yeshua is going to meet them in Galilee. But it's like that whole conversation went over their head. The only thing that they was mainly focused on is that the body wasn't there. Stone was rolled away. All we saw was a young man in there and the young man told us the body is gone. That's the only thing that stuck and registered in those women's mind. So after they found out that the body was gone, nobody it came to their attention that, wait a minute, didn't Yeshua say that something like this would happen? Peter and the other disciple ran out of the house to the scepter to go see for themselves. Once Peter arrived, he went in and saw the linen cloth lying by themselves. He departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. So Peter had to see for himself. What a lot of us seeing is believing. Some of us don't believe it unless we see it. People can talk all they want to, but don't nobody believe you until they see it for themselves. So here it is. Peter then ran to go see for themselves. Okay, they got to be telling the story. I know that body ain't gone. Once they made it there and all they found were the clothes in their place, meaning they were in the same place as though the body was still there, but there was nobody at all there. Peter walked away wondering about what his eyes just saw. I can't believe it. There is no way that that body can be gone. What happened? It didn't come to Peter's remembrance about what Yeshua said to him. He was still astounded about what just happened. Nothing came to his remembrance. Nothing, no type of clue came to his mind about what was said to him. A time of teaching. After they had dined, Yeshua asked Simon Peter a question. Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Yeshua said, then feed my lambs. 
Yeshua asked Peter a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And Peter answered and said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then feed my sheep. Yeshua asked Peter a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? This made Peter grieved because he asked him three times, lovest thou me? This is when the breaking began. Peter said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Yeshua said, then feed my sheep. Notice that Yeshua took him through the same stages that he told him he was going to go through before. He told him that before men, you were going to deny me. That hurts the Lord more than anything when you deny him in front of others. So he had to retest Peter on those same things. Not only did he retest him, but he made sure he took him back to his old name. Simon also connected him to his father, son of Jonah. Meaning that that title I gave you, you're not living up to that title right now. You're not living up to a stone. You're not living up to being a rock. That which I want to build my foundation on. So I have to test you to make sure you're ready for what's to come. So when he asked him the first time, lovest thou me? And Peter said, yea, Lord, you know I love you. Yeshua said, then feed my lamb. Lamb is in two stages. Lamb could be the little ones when he said, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Lamb can also be an adult because you have some people that are milk drinkers that, rather than meat eaters. Some people who can only take in a little word at a time just so they can digest it versus those who can take in a lot of word and want, to, want you to continue to feed them. So, you got to start with the little ones. You got to start with the, the beginners. So feed my lamb. Then he asked him a second time. Now here it is. I know Peter wondering in his mind. Okay, you don't ask me a second time. Do I love you? I thought I already answered this. Yay, Lord. You know us that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Now we are feeding a mature, bigger crowd. I need you to lead my people. So a third time, third time is a charm. He asked him, Peter, Simon Peter, lovest thou me? And when he responded this time, it grieved Peter in his heart. One thing about us, when we've done wrong, and a person is constantly questioning you about the wrong that you've done because they haven't released it within themselves, the first thing they do is they think about that bad. The first thing they do is start beating themselves up all over again because I'm pretty sure right after Peter left bitterly that he beat himself up constantly about how he handled that situation. That he couldn't believe that he actually denied him the same way that Yeshua said he was going to deny him. So in his mind, he's thinking, this is what Yeshua was thinking about. He's thinking about how I denied him, how I betrayed him, how I let him down when I told him I was going to be there for him. But at the moment when he really needed me, I was nowhere to be found. This got to be what he's talking about. But it wasn't what Yeshua was talking about. Yeshua wanted to make sure that he finally released the old me. That he finally let go of Simon, son of Jonah. You have to let go of your old man to be able to walk into the newness of the Lord. That's the only way that this walk is going to work for you. If you continue to hold on to the old, it's going to tear you down. It's going to hold you back. It's going to keep you from doing that which the Lord has sent you to do. He needed to make sure that Peter was ready. And once Peter finally got it, Okay, you want me to feed your sheep. You want me to tell the people of you. You want me to lead them to you. Then that's what I'll do. 
Let's talk about Judas. Judas Iscariot. Judas also went through different stages. He might have not went through all of them, but he was with the disciples when a lot of these things happened to them. Let's talk about his time of teaching. Yeshua asked his disciples a question. Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He was talking about Judas Iscariot. The sad part is that none of the disciples asked him at that time which one was the devil because none of them believed that it was anyone that he would have chosen at the time. This is why you can never judge a book by its cover. See, when you first look at people, first thing you see is the outward appearance or you see what the persona of what a person wants to show you. And what they want to show you, it might look good. It even sounds good. But that's not really how that person is. They don't want you to see the real them because you might not like the real them. You might not appreciate the real them. But eventually, the real them will come out. See, with, with Judas, it was kind of hard for him to hide his real self at times. Even though he tried to be, you know, in disguise. He wanted to be among the crowd. But he also was chosen. Yeshua chose him along with the rest of them. And that's what he was admitting to. Out of all you twelve, I chose each one of you. But one of you is the devil. Why do you think that Yeshua would choose the enemy and place the enemy right in the camp? I mean, that's an amazing question to kind of ask yourself. You think about the saying of, you know, you keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. That could be one way. But I don't believe that that's why Yeshua did it. Yeshua did it because he knew that the scripture had to be fulfilled. In order for the scripture to be fulfilled, you got to put the right person in the right place. You got to put that player on the board. If you don't never put the player on the board, then the play will never come to pass. So he placed him in the playing field. He allowed him to be around him to see everything that was going on. Now, there were certain moments when Judas was not allowed to go. Because during certain moments, if he was allowed to go, it would have built up his faith in a totally different way. Judas was only allowed to see certain things, only allowed to experience certain things. Because he still had a job to do. And nothing could deter him from that job. A time of teaching. Judas asked Mary why she was using ointment on Yeshua's feet instead of selling it and giving the money to the poor. Judas was a thief. Meaning he could care less about the poor. Only about how much a person could have received for the ointments. Yeshua informed him that there will always be poor among them, but he will not always be here. A time of making. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. The chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan unto Judas. Hold on, wait a minute. Let me read that again. Then entered Satan unto Judas. I was told by somebody a long time ago that we already have the spirit of the Lord inside of us as well as the spirit of Satan. Satan is our negative side. The Lord is our positive side. So when you do negative stuff, that's Satan working. When you do positive stuff, that's the Lord working. But that's not what scripture said. I even asked my six-year-old uh, the same thing and explained to her that, hold on, wait a minute. It said that then entered Satan into Judas. And I explained to her how somebody told me that negative was already on the inside of us, meaning the devil is already on the inside of us and the Lord is already on, on the inside of us. My six-year-old came into the living room. She was like, okay, I'm already in the living room. How can I enter the living room if I'm already in the living room? I said, my point exactly, baby. The word is easy enough that even a babe can understand. 
It's not rocket science. No matter how many different things that they put out there saying this is what it is and that's what it is, that doesn't make it true. It is a spirit. Satan is a spirit. You are a vessel. You have to understand that you are a vessel. The same way that Yeshua praised Peter for acknowledging that he was the son of the Most High God is the same way that Satan turned around and used him not even a few steps later by rebuking Yeshua. And he told him, I rebuke you, Satan. Get thee behind me. For you care not of the things of the Lord. You only care about the things of man. When you care about the things of man, that seems to stand to the forefront. This is the same thing that Judas was doing. The things of man always stood to the forefront. So he was an easy target. He was an easy vessel. Whenever the enemy sees an easy target, that's the main one that the enemy will use in order to tear down a situation that's coming to pass. So it says, then Satan entered into Judas. Judas communed with the chief priests and captains about how he might betray him unto them. They were glad and paid him 30 pieces of silver. He promised and looked for the opportunity to portray him unto them when he wasn't surrounded by a multitude. So here it is. They found a weak link out of the disciples. See, Satan had already been using them on numerous occasions to try to find a weak spot, to try to trip up Yeshua. But they couldn't. Every time they would try to use scripture, he would use scripture back on them which would knock down that what they said because they were intertwining their scriptures with the laws of man, with the, with the traditions of man. That don't work. You're either going to be in the law that the Lord has set before you or you're not. We're not going to talk about these things that you added on along the way. That's not acceptable. So here it is. He managed to find them. How is it that he found them? Because Satan had gotten inside of him. Satan already knew where the priest was, led him straight to the priest. Also made sure that the priest gave him money. They gave him 30 pieces of silver, which back then was the price of a slave. And Judas was happy. He was excited to receive 30 pieces of silver. Like he had never received 30 pieces of silver before. Being a thief, you would think that maybe he had done received a little bit more money than that. But no. 30 pieces of silver was all it took to portray the Savior. He didn't want to do it around anyone. He wanted to wait when, he, when Yeshua wasn't surrounded by the multitude. Same thing with the chief priests and the captains. They also didn't want to do it around nobody else because they feared of how the people might react if they went up on him and took him all of a sudden. A time of making continues. The day before the feast of Passover, after they had eaten supper, the devil put in Judah's heart to portray Yeshua. The first day of the feast of unleavened bread is called the feast of Passover. Yeshua sat down with the twelve, and while they were eating, Yeshua said, One of you shall betray me. This was the second time Yeshua said this to them. But this time, each one of the disciples asked Yeshua, Lord, is it I? Peter asked him, who was he talking about? Yeshua said, he that dips his hand with me in the dish is the same one who will betray me. But woe unto that man who betrays the son of man. It would have been good if he had not been born. He basically pointed his finger at Judas. He dipped in the bowl and handed it right over to Judas, and Judas dipped next. They both dipped in the same bowl. None of the disciples understood. Hold on, wait a minute. Didn't he just say the same person who dips with me is the person who is going to betray me? But it wasn't time for nobody to pay attention to that. That went right over their heads, even though they were trying to ask the question to see if it was one of them. They felt like once they was off the hook, it, it ain't me, Lord, so ain't no need to me to worry about that. 
they was no longer thinking about it. Even Judas himself didn't understand that he had been outed. He took it as, oh, maybe it ain't me he's talking about. I mean, we, I, I dipped after him, but maybe that ain't what he really meant about, you know, the person, you know, that dips with him. Anybody else dipped in the old thing too, but nobody dipped after, after him except Judas. There's a scripture in the Bible that I used to always wonder about, and I hear people talk about it all the time. But there have been different things that have been making this scripture come to life for me. In Jeremiah 1 and 5, he says, on earth as it is in heaven. One thing Yeshua spoke to Judas is that it would have been better if he would have never been born. Judas' sole purpose of birth was to betray. So much that Yeshua was able to signal him out and know this is the man that will betray me. I'm going to make him one of the 12 of the disciples that will follow me. Because I got to keep him close so that he can do what he's supposed to do. So that scripture can be fulfilled. But that's not a good thing. He said, woe unto that man. For it would have been good if he were never been born. I listened to a prophet say something that I never really paid attention to once before. He said that each one of us has an angel in heaven that looks exactly like us. I started to ponder that and think about what he was actually saying. As I was thinking about it, the Lord brought something to my attention. He brought back a documentary that I was watching about angels. And there was this young lady on there. It was her and her daughter home that day. She said that she was out in the wash area washing clothes. She left her daughter in the living room reading. And while she was in there washing clothes, the machine wouldn't start. It was acting up. She noticed that it was unplugged for a little bit. She noticed that it was unplugged a little. So she reached over to plug it in. And when she reached over to plug it in, she didn't notice that the cord had a slit in it, a shortage in it. So when she stuck it in, she began to be electrocuted. And nothing was stopping it. She was standing by the washer just shaking. All of a sudden, her daughter came in there, moved her away, and walked back off. Didn't even say nothing to her. Once she came to herself, once she calmed down and was able to catch her breath, she went in there to where her daughter was to thank her daughter for what she had did. Her daughter was still sitting in the same spot. And she said to her daughter, baby, I thank you for coming in there, but you should have never came in there. You're not supposed to touch somebody if they're experiencing something like that because you could have been shocked. Her daughter looked at her and said, mommy, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been in here reading my book the whole time. That wasn't her daughter that saved her, but yet still her daughter's angel. Okay, let me take you a little further than that, just in case you don't believe it so. During the time when Peter was in prison, he was praying and the people were praying for Peter. One of the disciples had just been beheaded. Peter felt like he was next in line. He was in the jail cell sleeping when the angel came to him loosed the shackles that was off him, opened the prison doors, and told Peter that he can go. Peter left out and went to the people's house, knocked on the door. A damsel answered the door. When she heard that it was Peter, she opened the door, noticed it was him, slammed the door, went to tell everybody that it was Peter at the door. They didn't believe her. They was like, girl, you don't know what you're talking about. It probably was just Peter's angel. Here it is, another area of where they spoke out that we have angels that look just like us. Let's take you to another segment. One of the things that the Lord said to Jeremiah, he said, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I knew you and I deemed you a prophet of the nations. How is it that Yeshua knew him before he was formed if it is not one like him 
already. This is a fruit, a fruit for thought. To understand that when it says on earth as it is in heaven, there is things that are going on in heaven that you don't know nothing about. Things that we each have an angel set out there. Go back over, reread those scriptures to see if you get that same thing of what I got. That was like an amazing thing to me to know the documentary came before my eyes. To know that here it is, certain scriptures came to my eyes to let me know, wait a minute. There has to be a lot of truth to that. Because if, if it wasn't, it wouldn't come up in those different segments the way it did. In the first segment, that young girl didn't know nothing about that. And we all know that if somebody is being electrocuted and somebody touches them, that current passes from one person to the next. It doesn't stop unless there is something different about the person that touched them. That caused that current not to travel through them. Judas said, Master, is it I? After Yeshua was done dipping in the dish, he handed the dish to Judas and said, you said it. Satan entered into him. Here's the second time that Satan wasn't already there, that he decided to enter into him because a job needed to be done. See, you have a certain type of boldness inside of you to say and do certain things. There are certain times Satan can say things to you that get inside of your head and you might make a response. Or certain things might go through your head on a constant and you will finally make a response. But when a job needs to be done, he needs you to complete a job. When you hear about people killing or molesting and stuff like that, that is no longer that person. But it is something used in that person. Because some of those people at times don't even understand what they did. Or can't even believe that they did. Or you find them later on repenting what they did if they are really sorry for what they did. Well, here it is. Satan entered into him. Then Yeshua said unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Meaning, while you got this spiritual boldness on you, go ahead and get it over with. You got a job to do, so do I. So go ahead and do it quickly. This is a time of teaching. After Yeshua was done praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, while he was warning his disciples, to rise and pray, lest they enter into temptation. Behold, a multitude came along with Judas, one of the twelve. Judas moved in front of the crowd and drew near unto Yeshua to kiss him. Yeshua stopped him in mid-stride and said to him, Judas, betrayest the son of man with a kiss? Now, that's some real boldness right there. Not only are you coming and bringing an entourage to portray the Son of Man, to portray Yeshua, but you are also trying to do it as though you're his friend, trying to do it as though you really care for him. There are a lot of people that do stuff like that. They act like they care for you, but they only after their own selfish gain. They'll tolerate you long enough for them to get what they need to get out of you. Him getting what he needs to get was the 30 pieces of silver. That's where his pleasure moment came from. He felt like he was rising off of that little moment of 30 pieces of silver. Then he came in like he loved it. Came in like that was his best bud, his best friend. Came in to get ready to portray him with the kiss, knowing that kiss didn't even come from the heart. Jesus backed off and looked at him and stopped him. Judas, you going to betray me with a kiss? You've been better off just bringing them to come get me. You, ain't ha you, don't, you don't have to fake in front of me. I already know what you come to do. I already called it out. But yet still you're trying to play this role to the fullest. There are people who will play their role until the bitter end just to get to what they, what they really want to be. It didn't make it right when Judas did it. And Yeshua called him out. And it doesn't make it right when you decide to do it. Because you too will get called out of the mess. A time of understanding. Once Judas saw that Yeshua was sentenced to death, he repented for what he had done. And tried to return the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest 
and the elders. He told them that he had sinned and betrayed innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? He cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hung himself. Think back. Was that 30 pieces of silver really worth it? In the end. All that that you pushed to do to get to what you really wanted. Which was the money. You made it to the money. And the money wasn't even pleasurable to you no longer. You made it to what you wanted. And that wasn't even everything it was cracked up to do. So now you're trying to return it. Trying to make things right on what you allowed to happen. But it was too late. The deed had already been done. They had already sent him away. They weren't finna turn back the hands of time for him because that's what the enemy was trying to do in the first place. The enemy felt like I already got what I wanted. The enemy will use people to destroy you. That's his job. The word says that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Each one of those phases he came to Yeshua with until he finally got to the killing part. Who ended up being destroyed in the end was Judas. Judas was destroyed because he couldn't deal with the grief. He couldn't deal with understanding that that person really didn't do nothing wrong. All that person did was show me love. All that person did was show me kindness. All that person did was try to eat me the truth. All that person did was raise me up. Try to show me a, a right way. And all I could do in return was stab him in the back. All I could do in return was betray him. For 30 lousy pieces of silver. That don't even mean that. That I didn't even get to enjoy. Because it wasn't worth it. Who are you willing to betray? For something that you've envisioned to be great. Will you stab a person in the back for that? Will you push them to the wayside? Because the grass looks green on the other side. Because you feel like it's better. Even though you haven't seen that side, but you got these big dreams and big visions about the other side. But who toes are you stepping on in order to get there? Who are you willing to betray for? It? After Yeshua was raised from the dead, Yeshua asked Peter if he loved him. Once Peter was done answering, Peter had a question for Yeshua. Lord, which is he that betrayed thee? And what shall this man do? Now, Peter didn't pay no attention that all the disciples was there except for one. Judas wasn't there. He got his eye on John. The one whom Yeshua loved. That's who he looking at. Thinking that it had to have been John who betrayed him. Thinking that John was putting on an act in front of everybody. There ain't no way you feel about Yeshua that type of way. You gotta be laying all on his bosom like that. I mean, come on now, you you overdoing it. But no, Yeshua understood what he was trying to do. And Yeshua's response was, unto him, if it will that he tarry till I come, what is that of thee? Follow thou me. Once again, Peter became son, son of Jonah, thinking that he could get to the bottom of a problem by asking questions that ain't had nothing to do with him. Thinking that he could actually make a difference or try to go do something about it, even if he knew. You sure want to know, okay, what is it to you if I decide not to do nothing to that person, but to allow that person to tarry until I return? That ain't got nothing to do with you. Your focus is supposed to be on Yeshua. You don't lost your focus again. How quickly do we lose our focus when the Lord puts things before us, a job before us that we're supposed to be doing? The main thing he asked them three times was, feed my lamb, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And you thought Peter got it after all that. At least he thought he got it too. But even now, in the midst of this, He's still focused on the wrong thing. You cannot allow the enemy 
to allow you to lose focus. The enemy will try his hardest to keep you off track. Because the more you're on track, the more people you can reach. The more lost people that you can save. The more you can build the kingdom of Elohim. He don't want you to build the kingdom of Elohim because if you're building the kingdom of Elohim and he's trying to build his kingdom, you're working against him. He's looking for more people to be on his side. He don't need nobody working against him. And notice when you're on his side, he don't bother you that much. It's the moments when you're not on his side and you know you're not on his side when he eating you up and hitting you on a constant. The enemy bothers me, not just daily, not just every hour, sometimes not even every minute. But seconds, he don't leave me not even for seconds before he's right back in my head trying to keep me off course, trying to steer me in other directions so I cannot be focused on the task that the Lord has at hand for me. And the more that the enemy comes at me, the more the enemy uses those around me to try to knock me off course, the more I know that I'm on the right track. The more that I know I'm right there at Victor's door. And you're trying to keep me from walking in. But I'm going to walk in. Regardless of how much you ruffle your feathers, it's not going to work. It is too much embedded inside of me in order for that to work. There were some disciples that once they got it, they got it. There were some disciples that had to be babysat along the way. I don't want to be that, that disciple, that person that... The Lord has to spend so much time with me because I'm just not getting it. I mean, I don't want to have to retake test after test after test. That's not what I want to have to do. I don't want to have to take those tests over and over again. Let's recap. When I first started this series, I told you that we all go through different stages when the Lord is preparing us for kingdom building. There are things within us that needs to be removed, that needs to be changed, that needs to be healed, restored, and built up. Yeshua did this with his followers. First, the invitation went out when he said to them, follow me. Notice that none of them gave him a hard time. Each one of them was already doing a job and they left their job and family members behind to follow him. Just off one command. Follow me. That command was so strong that it reached down into their spirit man. The word says, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. They knew deep down that Yeshua was not a stranger. Next began their spiritual walk. On this walk, Yeshua taught the disciples many things. Some were test, some were tested, many were shaken, some were made over, and a few were broken. But in the end, all his disciples except one came to the understanding that he was telling them the truth, the whole truth. We are just like these disciples. Some of us, we are tested. We don't pass the test. We are retested. We don't pass the test again. Some of us start asking questions. Why is it that I have to go through this same test over and over again? Because you didn't get everything that you were supposed to get out of the test the first time. A lot of us need to be made over. We've already been broken, but we stayed there. We stayed in that broken state. We stayed in that broken situation that we weren't ready to do kingdom building because we were too broken. Nothing had been made on the inside of us. Some of us go through shaking where you experience a, a bad situation and it shook you up. The way some walk away scathed, some walk away majorly bruised, others walk away seriously damaged goods. The way they're not able to lead people. And when you damage goods, you're only going to damage the others that are around you. Don't pass the test. Can't handle the shaking. Are you not ready for the making? Because we feel like there is nothing wrong with us. 
don't know how to pick up the pieces. When we're broken, or sometimes we don't even understand what it is he's trying to show us. The Lord will show us things over and over again. And we're just not getting it. He will give us instructions over and over again. And we just don't seem to get it. Like I said, how many times do people sit on the pew and hear the same word over and over again? It might have been your sixth time hearing the word. And finally, you understood what the preacher was trying to say here. It might have been your tenth time hearing the word. And this particular time, you didn't even hear from your preacher. You heard it from somebody else. And it came across clearer this time than when you first heard it. This is what was going on with the disciples. They heard him tell them what was going to come to pass over and over and over again. Every time he built up their faith, with the next situation, their faith seemed like it had diminished. And he'll build it right back up again, and once again it was diminished. He hadn't even started building up their faith through themselves yet. I mean, he hadn't sent them out and tell them, okay, well, now you can go cast out demons, you know, in my name. He hadn't told them that yet. All he did was say, follow me. Come walk with me. Watch me show you how it's done. And they did. And they still would come to him as though their situations were major problems. He didn't understand. One time he questioned me, how long shall I be with you? Basically, how long I got to be with you before you finally get what I'm trying to show you? Peter versus Judas. Peter was a fisherman. Judas was a thief. They were on two different ends of the wall. Total opposites. But they were both asked to follow Yeshua. Peter was a questionnaire type person. He asked question after question after question. And he recognized who Yeshua was. Judas was more of an observer. He was a spectator. He was a looker, a watcher. So he will watch everything that went on around him. That way he can find the weakest link. That way he can find, okay, this person keep their money in their, in their bosom right here. That person got these type of goods in their house. He was observing the situation. He had no clue who Yeshua was out of the whole time he was with him. It didn't come to him at the wrong time. And when it came to him, all he knew was that he was an innocent man that he had sent to death. They both heard the teachings of Yeshua. Shown things. Peter was shown things that most of the disciples didn't see. On the other hand, Judas in a lot of incidents was left behind. There were certain things that he couldn't see. There were certain people that have enough of the Lord on the inside of them. Have that love for the Lord on the inside of them. That he's going to show you a lot more than he'll show next, the next person. That only shows some type of love for the Lord. That only gives the Lord some of their time. That is only after the miracles and the works. But not the desire to lead people to Yeshua. See, that's all Judas wanted. He wanted the fame. He wanted the fortune. He wanted everything that was going on that came with it. Didn't want to do no work. Didn't want to really learn nothing. But just to be on the scene. Each one of them experienced fear. Judas was on the boat when, uh, when Yeshua walked across the water. He saw that. Judas was on the boat. When Yeshua came out and spoke to the winds and the sea and they obeyed. Judas was with him, them. When he spoke to the fig tree and they came back by and the fig tree didn't have no figs on it, but it had them withered up and died. Judas heard all the teachings. He experienced the fear moments. But popularity was the only reason why he was there. Yeshua knew that he was there because he had to fulfill purpose. Amazed by the things Yeshua did. Peter just wanted to know more about him. Peter just wanted to be closer to him. Peter wanted to experience some of the things that he experienced. 
That's the whole reason why out of all the, the 12 disciples, Peter was the only one who said, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come to you. He was the only one had somewhat of boldness to step out on the water, to try to attempt the trust, even though his faith started wavering. But he did a lot more than what the disciples did, than what the other disciples did. They both were told that they would do something to hurt Yeshua in some kind of way. Peter was told that he would deny Yeshua three times. Even though he tried to speak up how loyal he was, they just thought he was going to purchase something that Yeshua sent him to purchase something since he had the money bag. He kept the money bag because he tried to always keep the money close to him. That's what thieves do. They, they tight wards. They, they tight fisted. They don't want to release nothing. They think you're going to steal from them even though they're the ones that's the thieves. So take time to look over your life. Question yourself. Out of the things that you've done, we don't we won't even go through childhood because that's during stages of you you and your learning process. Go just straight from adult. Since you've been an adult, which role have you played in the kingdom? Has your role been trying to get closer to your shoe? Has your role been trying to learn more of Yeshua? Has your role been trying to understand Yeshua and how it is that he did all the miracles that he did? How it was that he had the type of power that he had? But you don't want that power for selfish gain. You want that power because you are truly there trying to feed his sheep, trying to feed his land. Or were you more like Judas? Were you an observer, sitting back like a wolf in sheep's clothing, waiting for that moment of when you can pounce, waiting for that moment of when you can stab a person in the back, waiting for that moment of when the outward appearance of you, seeming as though you love them so much, when in actuality, you're just trying to get to the next prize. They're just a stepping stone until you get to what you're really trying to do. Each one of them went through their own phases. Like I said, Peter went through all the stages. Judas only went through a few. Look back and check what stages you have been going through, through your spiritual walk. Have you been through the teaching? Have you been through the testing? Have you been through the making? What about the breaking? Did you come to the understanding? Like Peter did? Or did you experience how Judas did? Well, you were around the teaching. You, you had a few breaking moments, a few shaking moments. You never got made though. Understanding never really reached you. Does understanding reach you at the moment when it's too late? When you can't change the situation? That you have placed in the course. Remember we are all puzzle pieces. We're all on this big chessboard. You make a move. The Lord makes a move. You make a move. The Lord makes a move. But on this board. Once you made it to the other side. If you didn't make it to a victory state. Then your man is lost. Your man is taken. Judas was lost. He was taken off the board. No longer a player in this particular situation. He didn't get a chance to do a do-over. He didn't get a chance to say, hold on, I, I worked through that strategy kind of wrong. I see a different way that I could have did it. Let, let me, let's put the pieces back on the, let me try it again. He didn't get a chance to do that. Sometimes in life, you just don't get a chance to do things over again. But if you do get the opportunity to do it over again, do you make the same choices? Do you take the same routes? 
Do you make your routes just a little different than what they were before? But in actual in actuality, you still end up on the same road that you was on? Then where did your strategy really change? Where did you go back to the drawing board and see how you could have worked things different to make things better? Because remember, you wanted a do-over. You saw some things that you did wrong along the way, and you're trying to do it differently. But in this game of life, that doesn't happen all the time. So when you're given the opportunity to do it, but yet still when you get halfway through the board, you go back to your old tactics, you get the same results. The results doesn't change. Judas ended up feeling bad. He ended up being by his lonesome self. The same people that he went to that talked about betraying Yeshua was the same people who said, well, what is it to us that you betrayed an innocent person? They ain't got nothing to do with us. They had already got what they wanted out of the deal. And Judas became null and void to them. Think it over and see how you work it out. If we go back to the beginning of the question, Peter or Judas, which one are you? So make sure you guys that you like, subscribe, and comment if any part of this word touched you. Make sure you reach out. Have a wonderful night. Shalom.